There is more freedom of speech today in Libya than ever was in the history of Libya. It's inhuman treatment. It's barbarity, Mr. Bayou. We have to give the government a chance. Libya has a new government of national unity, which promises free elections by the end of this year. But the roadblocks it faces are immense. Armed militia groups still hold power throughout the country. They still kill and kidnap with impunity. My guest this week is Tamim Bayou, Libya's ambassador to the UN in Geneva, from where he joins me. How will this new government succeed where all the others have failed? Tamim Bayou, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. Thank you for your invite. Three days after your new government of national unity was sworn in, there was a shocking reminder of how little unity there is in your country. Up to 15 bodies were found handcuffed and dumped at a cement factory in the eastern city of Benghazi. While life remains so cheap and murderers enjoy almost total impunity in your country, there's nothing much to celebrate with this new government, is there? Well, that's not necessarily accurate because we don't, first of all, we don't know when this uh, crime took place. Secondly, uh, as you know, during transition periods, things tend to be, um, uh, take a little bit of time to, uh, to, uh, to come to a more stable environment. But you're not suggesting to me that there aren't daily killings and uh, discoveries of mass graves. If these killings go on, this government will fail like all the others, won't it? That's the point. Absolutely. And therefore, it's extremely important for the international community, the United Nations and all the mechanisms of the international organizations to come together and help the current government in every way possible. As a matter of fact, here in Geneva, if you uh, checked into this, you would know that we have passed a, a resolution at the 43rd session of the Human Rights Council calling for a mechanism of accountability, calling for the ability to hold this impunity of crimes committed and human rights violations committed in Libya. So we, we are seeking the help of the international community, the United Nations and all the various organizations to step in and help us be able to put impunity uh, at a stop. Well, you haven't um, shown much interest in doing that in the past with previous governments, have you? Um, this was just the latest of many mass killings, which I was talking about, by the dozens of militia groups that fight daily for control of your country. And unless your government, never mind the international community, but unless your government comes to grips with these groups, the new government is going to be just as powerless as all the others, isn't it? Well, again, we have to give the government a chance. And let's keep in mind that the government has not even been in, in office for 30 days uh, just yet, and uh, there's a lot of work uh, ahead. There's a tall order of tasks that need to be taken care of, including security and stability, but also uh, keeping in mind that uh, the role of the international community is extremely important. The partnership that Libya has embarked on with the international community through the United Nations is extremely important for the security and stability of Libya and the success of any government. So it is important for the international community to do its part. Let's not forget that we just came out of a proxy war. Yes, I mean, you can turn it over to the international community as much as you like, but it's got to be done on the ground. And uh, this is a government, um, and it's a weak government, and it's going to be uh, very difficult for it to gain control of those armed groups that have been allowed to capture so much of your state over previous years, hasn't it? And it doesn't look from what Abdul Hamid Dabeba has said, your interim prime minister, that he has very much of a strong commitment to either justice or, or accountability, does it? Well, you're, you seem to be judging the government before it even has a chance to be able to do anything. Keep it well, in I'm mind. judging it by what it's said or what it hasn't said so far. Let's, let's judge by what has taken place in the few weeks that it has been in office. Uh, let's look at the efforts that have already been done to reunify the institutions of the country. Let's look at the efforts that have been done into uh, stabilizing the security situation in the country through the Joint Military Commission, which let's keep in mind again that they ended a, a war in Libya. Let, you know, uh, just a few months ago, we would not even be talking uh, as... Well, it's a as, ceasefire. It's a ceasefire and it's a shaky ceasefire. So it's a bit premature to talk about the end of the war, isn't it? 
it's it's not a uh, a a solid uh, ceasefire. I agree, but uh, it is nonetheless a, a ceasefire, a stop of hostilities, and there is a chance for peace today. So let's embark on supporting this chance for peace. Um, we've seen that um, there are there are two major advantages in the Debeba government for the armed militia groups. Firstly, he's weak. And secondly, for the time being, he has the keys to the safe. Um, so it's in their interest to do business with him. But for how long? Um, they want a chance to get their hands on money. And I see that he's already promised local government a flurry of construction projects in various regions. Um, as long as he continues buying off these groups, they'll go along with him. If he starts getting tough with them, they'll get rid of him, won't they? Well, again, you know, you can you can pose these questions to the prime minister and, and, and know what his plans are. But let's keep in mind that when we have a proxy war, countries that were involved supported some of these armed groups in, in, in Libya, which caused much of the of the destruction and, and disarray that we have been in. Number two, keeping in mind that we have been calling for a DDR program, an SSR program. Keeping in mind DDR, that- DDR, DDR being what? DDR, DDR SSR. Basically, basically taking these young men out of these uh, armed group militias uh, environments and, and, uh, and, and turning them into a more constructive and positive elements of society. This is going to take a long time, isn't it? This isn't a short term. Of this course. isn't a short term measure. This is only a government that runs for eight months. Let's let's not forget that it's an interim government, isn't it? Absolutely. So let's not hold the the government so accountable for resolving everything with a magic wand. So we have to make. No, but let's, we can months. hold it accountable for certain things, and, and in particular for the very corruption it should be promising to fight. Because even before the vote, there were documented attempts by Debeba's supporters to bribe delegates to support him. That's pretty outrageous behavior, isn't it? Well, those, those are allegations, and uh, that's... Well, made by the UN. They're made by the UN, so they're not based on nothing, are they? Well, the UN is the same, is the same entity that supported the, uh, the dialogue and, and uh, supported the coming of the government into office, so... But they didn't support the uh, Debeba supporters who were trying to uh, bribe um, delegates to vote for him, did they? No. They didn't support that. That, that. Well, again, these are allegations that has not been proven of any sort, and uh, nothing has uh, been uh, stated by the UN uh, to that effect. Well, a UN inquiry said the PM supporters offered bribes as high as $200,000 to induce people to vote for him. UN report was quite specific. It said at least three such bribes were offered, although all of them were apparently turned down. Well, again, let's ask the UN about that and why they supported the outcomes of the, of the dialogue then in having the Debeba government come into, into office. Let's keep in mind, again, it's a new government. It's, it's a very well representative of the entire Libya. It managed to bring the entire country together. This is the first time that we have one government, one legitimate, recognized internationally and nationally, and given the trust by the HOR, which has not been able to do so for previous governments. The House so, of Representatives. That is correct, the House of Representatives. So we, we are seeing some positive steps in the right direction. The picture is not rosy. We have a lot of work. We have a lot of things that we need to address. It is not something that's going to happen overnight, but we need to build on the positive blocks that we have measured and been able to accomplish so far. You say that, but one of the worst aspects of these bribery allegations is that uh, Debeba's interim office described the claims as fake news when they clearly weren't fake at all. And that doesn't say much for the levels of honesty or transparency that uh, he says he's uh, going to adhere to, does it? His, his response to these allegations suggests that his government is going to be as dishonest as all the others have been, doesn't it? Well, I'll be happy to connect you with uh, his spokesman and he, he can address uh, these concerns for you. Mr. Debeba's reputation is pretty checkered, isn't it? He, he prospered mightily during the dictatorship of Muammar Gaddafi. He ended up running the Libyan Investment and Development Holding Company, which itself was rumored to have been involved in corruption and money laundering. Why should people trust him now, especially at this critical time? Let's, let's, let's talk about Libya here, because you're, you're, you're focusing on, on, on allegations, again, of one particular individual who can address these allegations himself. 
Well, allegations of the company, the company in particular that he that he ran. I'm here in my capacity as a Libyan representative to the United Nations in Geneva. Let's talk about what positive things that we've been able to do. Let's talk about the uh, resolution that was passed at the Human Rights Council calling for accountability for human rights violations and the mass parades and the, and the crimes that have been committed in, in Libya. Let's talk about the resolution that has been passed for repatriation of illicit funds that are right, rightfully owned by the state of Libya. Let's talk about the uh, initiative that was uh, supported peace initiative that was supported here in Geneva, which led to the signing of the of the peace agreement and the ceasefire in, in Libya. There are a lot of positive things that we need to focus on and we need to build on. These, this is the direction that we need to go if we want to give a chance for Libya to have a chance at peace. Let's not forget and let's put things in perspective. And, and this should be the benchmark. One, Libya, for as young of a country that it is, has come out of polarization, has been in military uh, and dictatorship rule for over four decades. Then it had a revolutionary transition period. We had meddling in foreign countries into the affairs of, of Libya. And, and state we capture problem. and state capture by the armed militia groups that were that allowed to get yes. close to power and still are in power. Listen, you, you talk about passing resolutions. Passing resolutions doesn't change the fact that you have indicted war criminals promoted to powerful positions in your country, haven't you? And they're still there. And there are plenty of examples of them, aren't there? Abdul Ghani Al Kikli, also known as Giniwa, now head of a new entity called the Stability Support Authority. He reports directly to the presidency. Human rights groups have documented war crimes and serious rights violations by his forces for more than 10 years. The UN reported that his troops have previously opened fire on civilians. None of that prevented his appointment, and his appointment is still in place. How is your country? Can you tell me this? How is your country to move forward when these people who are suspected of serious war crimes are in these enormous positions of responsibility? Well, as you just said, suspected. You know, I'm not here to be a court to judge on, on these individuals. I'm here to be able to unify the international community's position on the Libya situation. And we need to address many issues, some of which are the ones you mentioned, but we also have to address, and that's on the international scope, the interventions and the interference of, of other countries into the affairs, the internal affairs of, of Libya. If we work on that, as far as I'm concerned, from my position here in Geneva, that is a major accomplishment. Yes, we need to work on a lot of fronts, but this is the front that we need to focus on and we need to work on to unify the international positions on Libya. We've talked a little bit about accountability and justice. Amnesty International described in a report two months ago the justice system in Libya as dysfunctional and ineffective. Judges and prosecutors, it said, risk assassination and abduction for doing their jobs. Isn't it a fact, then, that virtually every check and balance, every restraint on illegal power and criminal activity has now been removed in Libya, hasn't it? How do you put all that back together again? Well, it's, it's, it's a process, and it's a complicated process, and it requires a lot of work, and we recognize that. We do know that we have problems. We do know that we have major issues that we need to deal with. But we need the help of the international community to do that. And how do we do that? We do that by stopping the intervention and the meddling into the internal affairs of Libya. We stop the, the impunity of the violations of the, of the, uh, the uh, Security Council uh, resolutions and the violations of arms uh, embargo by many states who support some of these factions that we're talking about, the armed groups. We do that by helping control the borders of, of Libya. And Libya has been calling for, for a long time, the support of, of common shared borders with our neighbors, as well as uh, the, the, our partners, the European partners, and to come in to help in Libya to do that through the UBAM agreements. We need, we need to activate all these things. We can, it's a domino effect issue. 
to multiply. Mr. 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 Bayer, this government is only designed to last until December the 24th. That's the date when Libyans are supposed to freely elect the next administration. That's only eight months away. What chance does this weak government have of organizing those free elections with the massive human rights abuses that are taking place in your country day after day? Well, that, that, that is correct. And they, and they recognize that and they recognize what their agenda is. But it's, 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 it's a process. It's a, building process. it's a building blocks process. We have to start somewhere. We but it's say either a realistic process or it isn't. You know, you have the UN Special Envoy for Libya, Jan Kubisch, telling the Security Council last month that his office continues to document a horrific catalogue of brutality in your country. Killings, enforced disappearances, sexual violence, including rape, attacks against activists and human rights defenders, and hate crimes. The international, responsibility, international community isn't responsible for that. The meddling that you've talked about isn't responsible for that. That's coming from people, your own people inside your own country, isn't it? You think that sets the right conditions for a free and fair election in Libya in just under eight months' time? Well, again, it's a building process. We have to take major steps in going forward in the right direction, the positive direction. All these issues must be addressed. And the international community does have a role in this. As a matter of fact, as I stated earlier, the international community and some of the countries that have meddled into the internal affairs of Libya were the primary cause for some of these things that you're talking about. We need to be able to make a, a stop to that, make sure that we give Libya a chance to address its concerns. It's problems. And we do know that we do how have- How long is this going to take? How long, how long do you want a chance for? Well, you know, you've, you, you, not, you had a, a government of national accord before. That didn't do it. It was a government of appeasement. You know, it, it, it prioritized um, uh, uh, paying off the groups and appeasing the armed groups uh, over justice. That, I, I, is this government going to make the same mistake that the last one did? Then let's, let's be fair and let's be balanced and looking at things, all right? That, what you just said, could, could be said about countries who have been paying off armed groups in Libya who have been causing much of these problems that you're talking about. We need to be able to address the issues as they are. So let's, let's, let's control the situation where Libyans can handle the, the, the process internally, and then we can judge and hold accountable the government and what it can do and cannot do. Well, I, I, I want to match the uh, situation in the country to the prime minister's rhetoric, if that's indeed possible. The new prime minister is on record, for instance, as saying he wants to spread a culture of freedom of opinion and expression. How exactly will he do that when journalists have to work in constant fear in your country? The rights group Reporters Without Borders says, for instance, that the toll of abuses against journalists and media outlets by armed groups associated with successive Libyan governments has grown steadily. We're talking murder. We're talking abduction. We're talking torture here. You, you, you keep focusing on the crimes, and we recognize those crimes, and we do understand that they're there, and we're there to they're fight them. They're pretty big ones, and they're, they're pretty important ones, aren't they? Well, of course they're important. That's why Libya is going through a transition. That's why we need to get out of this violent, violent phase and be able to get into the restoration of a country institutions, be able to set into a civilian uh, democratic state and be able to give the human rights to the Libyan people. Keeping in mind, again, if it's the, the benchmark that we established early on in the conversation, that this is a, a new culture that we have to go into that we are not so well experienced about. We do need the help to be able to accomplish that. And the, the will is there. The, 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 uh, the goals and the objectives have been set since Fe February 17, 2011, in wanting to, to, to set up a democratic state that is based on freedoms, that's based on justice, that's based on the ability to prosper and do well. And the current but prime those, minister... Those are, those are great words, but how do you get there? How do you get there when you have these enormous roadblocks in your path? How do you get there? You know, well, you, it, without a free press, you don't have a basis for democracy. You don't have a free press. There's no law in Libya guaranteeing the public's right of access to information, is there? What, what are the chances there'll ever be one in Libya? Well, you know what, Tim? There are more TV stations in Libya today than there ever were before. You know what, Tip? The people are talking about wanting 
to set up freedom of speech in Libya. Not only that, there is more freedom of speech today in Libya than ever was in the history of Libya. Really? It's chaotic. Really? It's not really? Chaotic. We do need reporters, to pass policy. Reporters Without Borders says Libya has reached its lowest ever position in the group's World Press Index. Once 164 out of 180 countries. That's worse than during the Gaddafi era. That's a huge step backwards, isn't it? Well, again, I don't know what information they're basing their, their, their reports on, but we do, do, we do need to recognize that there is more of a chance to be able to set up a civil state set up on democratic values, on freedoms, on justice today than we ever had a possibility to be able to do so in the past history of Libya. And we need to be able to capitalize on that. We need to be able to support that. We need to be able to work on that. And we recognize that the order is tall, but there is the will and there's the commitment to want to go down this path. And we need to get the commitment by all Libyans and others, the international community included, to support that effort. Even before Libyans get to the December elections, this government is committed to holding a referendum on a new constitution. Um, again, how you do inform the public without a free press is, is up to you. But what if you miss the deadlines? What if you miss the deadline for this new constitution and the new elections? It's pretty tight, isn't it? Ceasefire could right. unravel if you don't get there. It, it is it is very tight and uh, you know the possibility of missing the deadline is, is possible as a matter of fact the united nations has has missed many deadlines in the past in the process of coming to this point so we do need to work the commitment again is there the will is there and the efforts are underway keeping in mind uh the 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 process uh, has already been uh, uh established with some other deadlines. There's a July 1st deadline to uh, agreement on a constitutional basis to passing a, a legislation to uh, ensure the elections uh, law and uh, the preparations for the High Electoral Commission to do its work to allow for the 24th of, of uh, December elections. But there is also another very important deadline. There's a deadline that we have already passed. The international community has passed. The United Nations has passed the exit of all foreign fighters and mercenaries out of Libya. That has yet to happen. That is extremely important because stability and security, again, to your point, is extremely important to be able to do these elections in a stable and secure environment. Mr. Bayou, we've heard a lot of grand rhetoric um, from the Prime Minister about Libyans being one unit, one heart. That heart hasn't been much in evidence these last few years, has it? Look at the shocking way migrants have been treated in your country. In the last two months, hundreds of them have been intercepted, trying to flee Libya in small boats and head for Europe. Do you know why they're so desperate to leave Libya? And do you know what happens to them when they're brought back to Libya, these migrants, many of them? Do you know that? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact, Tim. But let me correct you. What you're saying is not accurate. Uh, number one, these migrants, when they left their towns and their villages from the various countries in Africa, they set their mind in going to the northern shores of the Mediterranean. They were not coming to Libya. Libya is a transient country. Everybody knows that. The same reports that you refer to, the UN reports, everybody knows that. But also, and yet, in, and yet in Libya, they continue to be systematically subject to arbitrary detention and torture in both official and unofficial places of detention. Are you proud of that? No, I'm not proud. We do have problems, and the Libyan government has recognized and continues to recognize the violations of the problems that we have with migrants. The Libyan government has been associated with these violations. It's been directly associated with these violations. Uh, Tim, let me, let me just finish this point. It's extremely important. What you're referring to constitutes uh, crimes or alleged crimes on a population of about 4,000 migrants in detention centers or what's called gathering and, depo uh, and departure facilities. It's inhuman. Yes, it's inhuman treatment. It's barbarity, Mr. Bayou. It's inhuman treatment. We're talking about sexual violence, abduction for ransom, extortion, forced labor, unlawful killings. It doesn't matter whether it's 4,000 or 4 million. Why, why are you, what does it say about your people that you're treating migrants in this way? 
That is not correct, uh, uh, Tim. Your, your information is not fully accurate. You're reporting half of the information uh, that has been out there. Let me also repeat to you, as I was stating, the, the alleged crimes that you're talking about, which the Libyan government has been dealing with and continues to work with and deal with with the various UN organizations, is concerning some facilities where there's no more than four or 5,000 at the most um, of migrants that happen to be in these facilities because they're supposed to, and the UN organizations also know that. These are uh, migrants that are supposed to be lifted to another uh, uh, country. But the rest of the, of, of the migrants that we have, and we have about a million in Libya, live freely and safely among all Libyans throughout Libya. All right. Tamim Bayer, yes. we've run out of time. Thank you. Right. Thank you for making that point, and thank you very much for your time on Conflict Zone. Thank so, you. Thank you.